Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frazer. This week marks our 100th program since we launched on Bloomberg Radio Boston almost two years ago, beginning our effort to build the syndicate network. Thanks to you, we're broadcasting 16 times a week in 10 cities across the country. It's been a joy bringing you a wide variety of guests discussing real-world political and social issues of the day from a nonpartisan perspective. Usually I let my guests do most of the talking, but this week I'm going to tell a story. It's a story I was privileged to learn when the Antigua Forum commissioned me to research and publish a monograph on the miracle of New Zealand. The Antigua Forum is a gathering of political reformers and entrepreneurs from around the world, held in Guatemala every year in cooperation with the Universidad Francisco Marroquin. Before I embarked in this project, I knew very little about New Zealand's unique political journey. It has so much to teach us. Two decades ago, the country went through a dramatic transformation from a welfare state saddled with crushing public debt, rampant inflation, and a closed and more abundant economy to what is today one of the freest, most prosperous, and open countries in the world. This is the story of how that happened, and it's quite a political drama. Our journey begins in 1981, when twin political and economic crises opened up a window for dramatic change. Two individuals stand out in the struggle for reform, Sir Roger Douglas and Ruth Richardson. Though members of parliament from opposing political parties, the two made common cause, often working against their own party leaders. Together, they dominated New Zealand politics for about a dozen years, delivering lasting reforms that transformed the country. Today, Roger and Ruth are widely respected elder statesmen. I was able to track them down and pick their brains for a few hours with a recorder running. Let's begin with Roger's description of life in New Zealand in the 1960s. New Zealand, really, the wasted years were probably the 60s. We lived off the fat. We were the third wealthiest per capita country in about 1957. Historically, the majority of New Zealand's trade was with the United Kingdom until 1973 when the UK joined the European Common Market, the predecessor for the European Union. This change required the UK to abandon its favored trade relations, which dealt New Zealand a terrible economic shock. Ruth Richardson explains. New Zealand was a trading nation tied very much to the demand coming out of the United Kingdom. So Britain was seen as, as the mother country. So much of what New Zealand produced from the soil was destined to Britain. And so that was like a dedicated market for us. Britain then had a, a midlife crisis and went off and had an affair with Europe. And as a consequence of entering the European Union, it was effectively required to throw off all of its colonial preferences. And so New Zealand was effectively then, you know, like Finland when the Soviet Union collapsed, we were sort of thrown to the four winds. The political response to these changes was disastrous. As Ruth puts it, the government tried everything that didn't work. The results were increased protectionism, expanded entitlement benefits, wage and price controls, out-of-control deficit spending, and, of course, lots of money printing by the central bank. Put it all together, and New Zealand was headed toward bankruptcy. In 1975, Ruth Richardson's party, called the National Party, came to power when Robert Muldoon was elected prime minister in a landslide election. Critics described his campaign platform as a denial of economic reality accompanied by bribery of the voters. His actions once in office confirmed the assessment. Here's what Roger Douglas, a member of the opposing Labor Party, had to say about Muldoon. Muldoon was someone who surrounded him as far as possible with people who said yes. He didn't think forward. He sort of ran what was today. And if he couldn't do it himself, if he wasn't pulling the lever, he didn't think it could happen. He was an accountant and he never learned to be an economist. While the standard of living in New Zealand was higher than in both Australia and Western Europe during the 1950s and 1960s, under Muldoon's leadership, per capita income dropped to the lowest among all developed nations. 
In the election of 1981, the National Party government clung to its parliamentary majority by one seat. That seat was won by Ruth Richardson, elected to her first public office from a district on the outskirts of Christ Church. Not long after Ruth arrived, all hell broke loose. I was the majority, and I went in with a reputation of being a fire-eating market advocate. So I was regarded as, you know, nuisance from day one. So I sat in the front row of the caucus, and I looked Muldoon in the eye, and he said to me, what have you come to Parliament to do, girly? So I was all of 30. I said, I've come to defeat inflation. He said, no, 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 what have you really come to do? I said, I've come to defeat inflation. And there were no opening of the books at that time, and I knew that we were in real crisis, which he had basically hidden from the public. So I said to him, right, well, I'm the majority, uh, you're going to need my vote, and I'm going to need to be well informed, so can I please see the Treasury briefing documents? One major problem was that New Zealand's government finances were completely opaque. Ruth demanded to see the country's books, which were then held under lock and key. You show me the books, or I don't vote for you. Well, of course, all the caucus was completely horrified. Nobody had ever talked to him like that. Knowing his majority was at stake, Muldoon caved. That's when Ruth dug in for the first round of what turned into a 15-year fight. So I eventually got marched up to the Prime Minister's office. He wouldn't let me take any copies, so I just sat there for a day or so, just writing down how bad the state of the books were. So that, that, that was my initiation. The remainder of Muldoon's final three-year term was characterized by intense infighting with Ruth on the front lines. When Muldoon proposed to introduce wage and price controls in 1982, Ruth crossed the floor, which means she voted against the proposal, a move that in parliamentary systems is usually regarded as political suicide. The situation kept spiraling down, with inflation peaking at 18%. Treasury and Reserve Bank officials were terrified at the prospect of financial collapse. They consulted with senior Labor Party opposition leaders, most notably Roger Douglas, who was then the finance minister in waiting. Together, they helped frame an economic recovery platform based on the best ideas from around the world. The parliamentary elections of 1984 were a disaster for the National Party. The people of New Zealand had had enough. The Labor Party leader, David Longy, swept into power, becoming New Zealand's youngest prime minister in the 20th century. Most importantly, the party was publicly pledged to Roger Douglas's reform platform. Rapid change was afoot. The new government wasted no time making radical changes. A hostile press dubbed it Rogernomics. It was a tour de force. People had come to believe that this was a government that didn't blink. And that's terribly important. If you blink, then all the energy of your opponents is focused on getting you to change your mind. If they don't believe you're going to blink, then their energy is focused on how they're going to cope and deal with the changes which are about to happen to them. Following Roger's plan, they immediately floated the New Zealand dollar, which had been artificially propped up and removed all capital controls. This staunched the bleeding. The currency, now priced at its real value, helped boost agricultural exports. However, a much harder task remained in agriculture. The sacred cow of farm subsidies had to be slain, and not in slow incremental steps. They went at it with an axe. Roger also launched an all-out assault on the bloated state sector, getting a bill passed that eventually privatized most state-owned enterprises. Top income tax rates, which had peaked at 66%, were slashed down to 30%, which is roughly where they remain today. Roger explains how he managed the resistance to reform. See, one of the big things about the changes we made in New Zealand was that they were comprehensive. Too many people make the mistake of they try to make a particular reform. Well, generally, that makes it hostile. We tended to do comprehensive reform, which meant we packaged a whole lot of things. People came to learn that whilst they lost their privilege, they actually gained from the privileges other people lost. 
and that in the end they didn't have government in the middle uh, taking money off them and then giving it back. Ruth handily won re-election in her own district despite her party's crushing defeat. She then used her position to egg on Rogers' reforms. She has a somewhat more colorful explanation of his strategy. You've heard of the expression, when the hits the fan? Uh, yeah, well, he said, put everything up in the fan, and, and then, you know, <laughs> you've got so many moving targets that they can't pick you off one by one. Opposition was vocal but disorganized, often working at cross-purposes. Do they try to save their own subsidies and privileges or work to remove the subsidies of others to reduce the overall burden? With Ruth's help, Roger was able to stay the course through Labor's first term as she set to work reforming her own party. While Robert Muldoon remained in Parliament doing what he could to thwart Ruth's efforts, Muldoonism was dead. In 1984, when we were defeated... I and others helped organise a coup against Muldoon and I was immediately elevated to, in a Westminster system, sort of your prizes to be on the front bench. So I was elevated to the front bench, which basically put lots and lots of noses out of joint. I mean, I was a very young woman. There were only two women in the whole of the party. So, you know, I stuck out like dog's balls a bit. So in the first three years of the Rogernomics, Roger pretty much had a free run. I was virtually the only one in the caucus who was saying this is the right thing to do. It's necessary but not sufficient because these guys can't tackle the labour market. They can't tackle fiscal policy, but they're on the right track. The economy began showing signs of life, but still had a long way to go. With the 1987 elections coming up, the old guard leadership of Ruth's National Party fatally miscalculated the sentiment of the voters. They believe most people would rebel against Rogernomics. We went to the polls thinking with all of this major market reform and upheaval and I mean, everybody's privileges and protections were all basically on the bonfire. Our party made the very, very incorrect political calculation that the population would rebel against it. Well, Labour were re-elected with an even greater majority than they had in 1984. That for us was the moment of truth, and that for Labour was when the rot set in. As the National Party licked its wounds, Ruth moved up to become opposition finance minister in waiting. Old Guard National Party stalwarts, who remained opponents of reform, were sacked as the party reevaluated its policies. But just as the National Party came around to the idea that even more aggressive market reforms were necessary, Labour began to backslide. In this unsettled political environment, Rogers still managed to pass three major bills that cemented his legacy. The State Sector Act of 1988 and the Public Finance and Reserve Bank Acts of 1989. Everywhere we make quality changes, they're there today. They're blamed for all the woes and the heaven knows what, but no one changes that, you know? The State Sector Act completely reformed the civil service. All government departments shifted from best effort budgeting to pay for performance. At the beginning of every budget year, elected government ministers contract with the heads of their departments via written performance agreements. These explicitly state which state services or results the minister wants to buy, how these results will be measured, and what the minister was willing to pay. Contract negotiations could be tense, but both sides had to buy into a realistic program. Even bigger changes were made. All civil service employees were removed from Job for Life union contracts with seniority-based advancement to individual employment contracts and merit-based compensation and promotion. This gave department heads complete autonomy to fulfill the terms of the contracts they negotiated including the power to subcontract or outsource some or all of the work to the private sector. And what I am arguing, what we argue, is not speed that's a problem, it's uncertainty. Transparency and accountability became the norm. Every government department was required to publish monthly and annual reports that gave incumbent politicians, opposition politicians, taxpayers, and voters the ability to see whether taxpayers were actually getting their money's worth. The effect was electric. 
and the lesson was clear. Stop selling the public short. Voters need and want politicians with a vision and guts to create a better future. The Public Finance Act of 1989 slowly transitioned all government accounting from an ad hoc cash accrual basis to the same generally accepted accounting principles known as GAAP required by businesses. This included a proper accounting of all long-term liabilities, funded and unfunded, as well as the recording and market-based valuation of every government asset and every piece of Crown property. Each government department was required to produce both monthly and annual public financial reports. Nowadays, any analyst or citizen can find these detailed documents on a publicly accessible government website. Go look for yourself at www.treasury.govt. NZ. Required annual audits made it harder to make farcical claims about balanced budgets since unfunded liabilities couldn't be hidden off the books or disguised with so-called trust funds like politicians in Washington have been doing with Social Security, whose alleged trust fund is nothing more than a pile of IOUs from Congress promising future taxation. Finally, the Reserve Bank Act of 1989 put the nail in the coffin of political monetary manipulation. Again, despite being in the opposition, Ruth was determined to get her national party to support the bill. So we had a pitch battle inside our caucus room as to whether or not my party would support the Reserve Bank Act. I wanted it to be bipartisan. I wanted financial markets to know that no matter which government you had, we were going to be disciplined and have a credible monetary policy framework that wasn't going to be a, a political tool or plaything. And on the day of the caucus debate, Muldoon was admitted to hospital. So he was absent, <laughs> which, which really helped. So I, I carried the party room. The Reserve Bank Act commands that the New Zealand Central Bank serve only one mandate, price stability, unlike the U.S. Federal Reserve, which serves the conflicting mandates of price stability and full employment. The elected government actually sets and publishes the policy target say an inflation rate of 0 to 2 percent, and a single Reserve Bank governor, not a committee, is responsible for executing that policy on peril of his job. The central bank structure holds the elected government responsible for the economic impact of the policy and the Reserve Bank governor accountable for faithfully executing it. Most importantly, it forever ended the practice of goosing monetary policy before an election to create a temporary illusion of prosperity. Despite these accomplishments, or maybe even because of them, the Labor Party continued to descend into chaos in the years leading up to the 1990 election. Roger Douglas and his Prime Minister David Longy set to fighting, and Roger resigned his cabinet position. When that happened, the Labor Party's poll ratings plummeted, going from 5 to 6 percent ahead of the National Party to 12 to 15 percent behind. Worn out by the infighting, Roger chose not to stand for re-election in 1990, leaving the Labor Party forever. All of this drama handed the National Party its opening. In the 1990 election, Ruth and her allies ran against a flagging reform government by promising even more market-oriented reforms. This included pledges to deregulate the private sector labor market and deliver major public spending cuts and reforms to the welfare system. The electoral landslide that put the National Party in power gave it a clear mandate to continue. This was Ruth's big opportunity. Within six months of assuming her new position as Minister of Finance, Ruth began slashing government spending. The liberal press dubbed it Ruthanasia. Effigies were burned in the street, Ruth had a bucket of blue paint poured on her, and she was required to have 24-hour bodyguards, an unprecedented development in a normally peaceful country. So I cut a lot of welfare benefits, you know, where you were better off as a young person going on an unemployment benefit than working. So I cut very significantly all your usual run of entitlements. And the most difficult was the retirement benefits, Domestic unrest wasn't Ruth's only problem. Economic turnarounds take time, so the government still had to borrow money in order to operate. Yet the financial climate had darkened. Here's Ruth again. 
we were about to be subject to a double downgrade, despite all the heroics of Rogernomics. So at the end of 1990, I introduced this big course correction and then was advised that Standard & Poor's were about to subject the country to a double downgrade. I said to my Treasury officers, over my dead body. So four of us got on the plane at the beginning of January. We got to Los Angeles and the Gulf War broke out. And by the time we got to New York, you had Bush looking at CNN with a New Zealand reporter reporting from Baghdad about where the bullets were flying and why. And then we had this eyeball with Standard & Poor's. And they have a committee of, uh, as I recall it, there are about five of them who make the decision. I was basically facing them down and saying, how dare you downgrade a country that's done a lot of reform already, a new government that's taken the really tough calls. How dare you downgrade us and not give us the benefit of the policy doubt that this is going to work? And we had the initial meeting with them and they were just stony-faced. You know, this was the early 90s. You know, I was wanting to see some quick wins for taking some very, very tough political decisions. I think there were two women of the five who made the decision, and I knew they'd made the decision by majority. So I just said to the guys, I'm going to play the sisterhood card. So I ganged up on the two women when we had sort of interludes between this tough talking and just said to them, look, I'm a new minister. I'm the first woman in my country to be a minister of finance. I've made calls that are, that are going to lead to me, you know, having to have police protection for all the time I'm a minister, which is unheard of in my country. You know, I'm absolutely hanging out there doing the right thing. And the last thing I want is for you to dump on me. And you just think about, you just think about somebody in my position. So I really put it on them. And then talk to them about, you know, how as women they'd done well in a world where men prevailed. And we got on the plane. We didn't know what the result was, but I played every single card I could, including the feminist card. Got on the plane as we landed. We were advised that we only had a single downgrade. How about that? Emboldened by her success, Ruth pushed on to reform the private labor market. Her Employment Contracts Act of 1991 ended government support for compulsory union membership and multi-employer labor agreements. Every worker and every employee was given the right to negotiate individual employment contracts. Union membership plummeted with a concurrent rise in productivity, flexibility, and competitiveness that contributed significantly to long-term economic growth. Ruth's next act was to introduce what whimsically became known as the mother of all budgets, a nod to the mother of all battles making the news in the Gulf War. Critics were aghast. This was the last transition budget moving the government toward full compliance with GAAP accounting standards, so it left no place to hide. A sharp recession cleared out the prior economic malinvestments and a new era of growth began. Ruth's 1992 budget was the first national budget in full compliance with GAAP standards, a practice that remains sacrosanct in New Zealand to this day. No more lying with numbers, no more obfuscation of long-term liabilities, no more kicking the can down the road. You'd think we could learn something from that. I was one lucky finance minister because in 1992, I was the first finance minister in the world to be able to produce my budget in generally accepted accounting terms. Now, the, the fact that I was still showing deficits, I mean, it didn't show a pretty picture, but at least it showed an accurate picture. The reform started to turn the tide, but with an election coming up in 1993, then Prime Minister Bulger from the National Party got cautious, hitting the brakes on further reforms. Ruth's role switched from being a champion of reform to fighting to avoid the political unraveling of everything she and Roger had accomplished. The only way to do this was to institutionalize the process of honest budgeting. The goal was to hold politicians' feet to the fire during the election season to avoid falling back into the trap of promising voters goodies that had to be paid for by future taxpayers. The National Party won the 1993 elections by one seat, putting Ruth right back where she began her political journey. She held that sword of Damocles over her prime minister's head, 
using it to pass the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1994. This codified a set of transparent budgeting procedures that made backroom chicanery politically poisonous. Uh, the idea was, as I was leaving the kitchen, to bang up the rules for fiscal cooking on the kitchen wall so that anybody who replaced me would be subject to those disciplines. It was an ugly fight that used up the last of Ruth's political capital. A few days after it passed Parliament, Ruth resigned her seat and left political office forever, tired but proud of what she and Roger had accomplished. When I took office, crown debt was heading for over 100% of GDP, and as I left, it was about 20% of GDP. So I was really proud to be the first woman finance minister. And when I left, I was replaced by two men. So they split the job between treasurer and finance minister. There you go. In 1994, New Zealand had the highest rate of job growth in the OECD. 20 years have passed since this political drama played itself out, and the results speak for themselves. The 2014 Index of Economic Freedom ranks New Zealand fifth in the world, behind Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and Switzerland, including ratings of 90% or higher for rule of law, freedom from corruption, business freedom, and labor freedom. The Lagatum Prosperity Index that looks at combined estimates of wealth and well-being rates New Zealand third out of 142 rated countries, clocking in at number one in personal freedom and number two in good governance. And GDP per capita? New Zealand climbed out of the basement to land in the top tier. H.L. Mencken once said, every election is a sort of advanced auction sale of stolen goods. It's a trap nearly every democracy has fallen into. New Zealand could have easily ended up like Greece. Thanks to Roger Douglas, Ruth Richardson, and the wise people of New Zealand, they avoided that fate becoming a happy exception. The question now is, which path will we choose? So what lessons does this story hold for us? While not yet in as dire straits as New Zealand was in the 1980s, some argue that the U.S. is on an unsustainable trajectory. Public debt has skyrocketed. Middle-class entitlements and unfunded public pension liabilities threaten federal, state, and municipal bankruptcy. Corporate welfare keeps climbing, and the economy is loaded down with inefficient subsidies, intrusive regulations, low growth, and messy partisan politics. The list of success factors required for democracy to flourish is not long. Honesty, integrity, transparency, accountability, efficiency, thrift, prudence, freedom, leadership, and courage. These are virtues not just for good government, but for a good life. While universally acclaimed by economists, philosophers, and theologians, why are these virtues so hard to find in politics? All politicians are human. That means they respond to incentives. And although almost all politicians enter office with a pledge to pursue the common good, a comprehensive system of perverse incentives eventually sets them on a different course. The hard truth is that democracies reward politicians with the prize they covet most, winning the next election, not for exhibiting universally admired virtues or even serving the public good, Instead, they're rewarded for dispensing largesse to their particular constituents and doing so in a way that disguises the cost not only to others, but to those constituents and sometimes even themselves. This is the problem that New Zealand fixed. Roger Douglas is keen to point out that despite all the blame laid on the reforms enacted 25 years ago for the passing troubles that have come New Zealand's way since, none of the core reforms have been undone because they worked. With the benefit of hindsight, the key to the reforms that saved New Zealand are easy to see. Let's list the top five. First, demand honest accounting. This is the bedrock of good governance. Imagine how much better off we would be if Uncle Sam followed the same gap accounting rules that every business in America has to follow. Second, encourage transparency between rival parties and between the government and the people. Politicians pay lip service to transparency but New Zealand's reforms made it a matter of law, enshrined in statute. Third, create stability through sound money and a clear monetary policy. 
discretionary monetary manipulation by central banks has been the undoing of governments since Rome first debased its coinage. New Zealand became a model of monetary rectitude by insisting that its central bank have a single mandate, price stability, and that inflation targets be set and published by the government and then carried out by a single accountable central bank governor through a negotiated and published agreement. The country hasn't eliminated the business cycle, but the exaggerated booms and busts that have come to characterize much of the rest of the world economy now mostly pass New Zealand by. Fourth, use performance management-based civil service reform to deliver results. New Zealand moved all of its civil servants from union contracts with seniority-based advancement to individual employment contracts at merit-based compensation and promotion. It gave the permanent executives of every agency the flexibility to contract with elected officials and then to fulfill those contracts as they saw fit. Fifth, leverage private sector labor reforms to open up the economy. Rigid labor laws turn employees from assets into liabilities, which make employers reluctant to hire. Get rid of those burdensome rules and employment revives. Although New Zealand is a tiny country compared to the U.S., the political lessons for all nations are clear. Again, here are five key takeaways. First, comprehensive reform trumps piecemeal reform. Piecemeal reform creates an imbalance between the modest long-term savings delivered to the many and the jarring short-term shock experienced by the few. As a result, a vocal minority can concentrate its energies on blocking change. But when reform is comprehensive, and many different kinds of government subsidies are removed simultaneously, the political calculus shifts. As momentum builds and the scope of reform grows, the sum of the long-term benefits accumulate to the point that these can alleviate much of the short-term pain. This virtuous cycle becomes particularly powerful when the economy grows upon being relieved of the dead weight. As Roger Douglas put it, whatever their loss, each individual group also has a vested interest in the success of reforms being imposed on all the other groups. Second, reforms must be even-handed. Any special interest group exempted from reform for political reasons creates a model for other groups seeking similar protection for their privileges. Third, speed is of the essence. Once reformers gain the upper hand, delay becomes the enemy. Delay allows the opposition to organize and raise procedural roadblocks designed to distract, divert, and bog down reformers. The faster reforms progress, the sooner tangible results begin to accrue, offsetting the initial pain. In the end, action must be fast enough for the benefits to arrive before support for reform collapses. Giving certain constituents more time to adjust only encourages others to demand the same, which threatens the whole package. Fourth, resolve is essential. While few in New Zealand accepted all of the many reforms that took place, most were convinced they had no alternative. As Roger Douglas said, people had come to believe that this was a government that didn't blink. Finally, institutional disciplines must be established that outlive the reformers. This was Ruth's parting gift with her Fiscal Responsibility Act. Here's Ruth with the last word. The moral of the story is that if you do gold standard reform and you have gold standard institutions that perpetuate that reform, then the reforms live on beyond the passion and the championship of the individual. If you bound public policy with a series of institutional disciplines and principal disciplines, you will in fact go on yielding very good results despite in different administrations who have to operate in that framework. I'm Bill Frezza for Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. If the story of how New Zealand saved democracy from itself catches your fancy as much as it did mine, you can download the monograph from www.antiguaforum.ufm.edu. Real Clear Radio Hour is produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. You can check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. That wraps up our 100th show. I'd like to thank Bloomberg Radio for giving us the opportunity to come to you every week. 
and to the Competitive Enterprise Institute for its unflagging support. But I'd especially like to thank our producer, Amanda France, whose tireless efforts secure us a steady stream of great guests and whose just-in-time research helps me better prepare to speak with them. Please join us next week, same time, same station, when we return to our regular format. See you then. Thank you.